Hey, mother... Welcome to the party, pal! Welcome to another edition of, a silent edition of, Yippee Kai Mother Podcast. What is going on, Mother Podcasters? Yo! Hey, guys. Okay, please Good don't pantomime. Good. Glad to have you back, Chris. Don't pantomime the whole thing, John. We got, I was doing old sound. stone face, Ralph. That's, That's what, I was just doing old stone face. <laughs> yeah. Game one had. All right, so if John, if there's any indication what's going on right now, we're doing John's film tonight called What, John? The general from 1926. General, 1926. My question is, before we begin, has have any of you seen it prior to me picking it? Many yes. prints. Okay, Drew saw it and Sean saw it. Okay, so I picked. Uh, I didn't the general. see general. I know. I know you didn't. But I used Buster you, Keaton. Wait, look at. Look at. Just so you know. Look did, at my. Look at my business cards. I know. And you had a. You had that poster the in your uh, office right too. There. I know. Uh, so all Buster I, Keaton. I've wanted to bring this on for a That's long exciting. time. Very exciting. It's, it's one of my, um, um, I, I like silent film. It, it's probably my favorite silent film, and I am a huge Buster Keaton fan. I think um, out of all the great silent stars, Laurel and Hardy, Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, for me, I, I think the best filmmaker, the one who understood the camera and how to use it, was Buster Keaton, where Chaplin told better stories Harold Lloyd was actually a, a pretty good actor who, who created great characters. And Laurel Hardy were obviously funny. Buster Keaton did things on film that no one had ever done at, at that time. And and the the sad thing about this great film that really wasn't recognized as a great film till uh, the '60s and '70s, it was a it was a failure, and it really led to his demise because after this film, his contract was sold to MGM. He lost all his control and he made a couple of uh, good films there, but nothing uh, when he was on his own. So it kind of killed his career and, and until the revival in France in the 60s. But I love this film because when you when you look at a lot of silent films, they look like silent films made in the 20s. Mm -hmm. You look at this film and the way it was made, even though it's short. It looks like almost a contemporary film, the way it's filmed, the tracking shots that he uses. And, and the, the set design is spectacular, too. They spent, I think it was $400,000, which, you know, is $10 million today. So at the time, it was a giant budget for this film. And just to give you a little background, it was directed by Keaton. He had a co-director, but when he directs a film, it's his film. It's based on a true story that happened in the Civil War. It's also based on a book called The Great Railroad. Uh, there's two different titles to the book: the Great Railroad Local, uh, Great Railroad Chase, or the Great Locomotive Chase, which is based on that real event. The interesting thing about the book is it's written from the Union perspective, not the Confederate perspective. The Ooh. reason why he changed it was he felt like the Confederates who lost the war would be ki considered the underdog, so people would root more for that character, not the Confederacy. But his character, which you end up doing, you know, as I'm watching the movie, it was really funny because I've seen this so many times. But when I was watching that last, last night, I'm thinking I'm really rooting for the Confederacy in this film because you're rooting for him. He's the he's the hero of the piece. Right. Johnny Gray. Um, the look of the film is based on and he wanted accuracy. It's based on Matthew Brady uh, photos from the Civil War. And it tells the story, the true story of Union soldiers who uh, stole the general, which is a real train that's in a museum, I think it's in either in Georgia or Tennessee, um, to to uh, they wanted to block some railroads to uh, prevent the Confederacy from doing whatever they had to do through the railroads. And he originally wanted to use the actual general, but he couldn't use it. So they found three trains that were close to, to the general and use that. Um, the other th so so it's his story. They steal it. He's the engineer of the train. He steals it. And in essence, it's really a chase film. That's really what it boils down to for the brunt of the movie. Um, and and he ends up, oh, by the way, uh, he's in love with this. There's a love story and he's trying to get into the uh, Civil War 
they won't let him in. So sh- they they look at him. The and that was a true. That was a true thing too. That they wouldn't let engineers in. They That's needed right. engineers. That's right. So they wouldn't let him fight. enlist. That's right. right. So ultimately, he ends up getting involved as the engineer because he saves the train. And there's some great scenes with the bull cart that he does and the tracking shots because the tracking shots were done. The tracking shots were done on a half a mile length of track. Okay, so when you saw him on top and they were tracking him, that's the same stretch every time. If you look at the background, the background always stays the same. Now you've ruined it for me. (laughs) But <laughs> but they also he had he had 500 National Guard from Oregon as the extras and he would have them dress up in the blue Union uniforms and run one way then he'd have them all get in gray and go the other way so it's the the whole filmmaking process is pretty fascinating and the other thing about these films especially him he does all his own stunts and and if you look at the stuff that he does in this film it's it's pretty amazing a lot of the stuff I mean there's one scene that he describes as his most dangerous. And when you watched it, it really didn't seem that dangerous. But when he's on the front of the train with the split rail yeah. and he throws it down to get the other one, if that went wrong, one, it could have hit him. Two, it could have derailed the train. Yeah, because that, those... seems, that seems really dangerous to me. Yeah, it was. I mean, and it wasn't was styrofoam it rails. Cause you... How many times did they practice that? Well, I that they didn't I, practice it much. I don't know, because a lot of stuff he did one take. Practice. It's like the cannonball. When they originally shot the cannonball, they used real gunpowder. The thing flew over the train. So he had to measure the gunpowder in grains. So that shot, I watched a documentary on this, that shot where the thing is shot out of the cannon and lands in where he is, that's real. That really happened. They had to they had to do that perfectly. So so and and then you know he, he ends up becoming a hero. And there's a great scene at the end where the general takes off his uniform. Now he's all sad. And then they bring him a real uniform, and he's Johnny Ray. And then the ending where he's saluting everybody when he's on the track. I just I just love this film and the story around it. What he did to get this made. There's also a little tidbit. There was no print of this film till 1952 i think it was james mason bought keaton's mansion and james mason found in a hidden cupboard a print of this film and it's the only reason why we have a print of the film it's and i have the blue print too it's well i have the blu-ray restoration which is absolutely gorgeous i hope you guys saw it you know high quality because it really is a beautiful film um and it's i do it's sad for me because Keaton is was such a great filmmaker, and to know the trajectory of his career after this is really a sad thing. What happened to him? Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a drunk, and there there was a lot of bad. And he things had that, a divorce that set him off, and his yeah, his, his in laws ran the studio too. I mean, they were very. That's bad. right. That's right. But so he ended he... up writing gags for studios. I mean, he was in a funny thing happened the way to the forum, and then he did the beach movies, which brought him back. But it was really when they did a res- retrospective of his films in France that they started talking about Keaton like Chaplin and the rest of them because mm-hmm. they really didn't up until that point. And and like I said, to me, I, I've seen all his films. I, I just find him amazing. Oh, but the other thing, his hair, that was his real hair. That was not a wig. He grew it that long for the role. And if you look at him in his other – yeah. You look at him in his other films. Um, yeah. So, so I he's also love... in um, Sunset Boulevard, right? That's yeah. right. In the in the one of the the, um, the bridge scene, one of the waxworks. Which, by the way, he was a uh, world champion bridge player too. He used to write an article in a newspaper, so that's why they use him for that. But uh, I love this film. I hope uh, some of you who I know probably aren't into movies like this even enjoyed it. And I'm dying to hear what you guys think about it. I actually had not seen this movie. I've seen tons and tons of pieces from it, but I hadn't seen the whole thing. You know, it, it, it's it's one of those weird films where like you're watching it and you're like, you know, you can't help, at least for me, um, you know, I was a history major and um, I have never been one of the people that looks at the romantic South, the lost right. cause that Shelby foot put forth in um, his um, uh, history of the Civil War. Um, now, granted, I will say this, the only person I know that's read all three volumes of that is my father. <laughs> and, uh, but I read like, them. 
but there is like a there is it, it did really kind of give me that vibe of that there was that period of where we were you know and still to some extent in this country romanticized that era right. era um that all that being said putting that aside it was really an amazing piece of filmmaking like you can't have like just some of the shots you talked about like when they're on ba- on their top of the coal car and they're just chugging along um you know i can't imagine what it must have been like to to look at that in a theater and know that you had not seen anything else like that and the fact that he did use like tracking and moving shots you just didn't see stuff like that there is a lot of static stuff like i love love modern times charlie chaplin's modern oh yeah great film. i think it's brilliant right and it's got these amazing sequences in it but and there's some really funny stuff but but it is pretty static in a lot of ways like the the shots and stuff but i still think that's a great film um kind of like one of the pantheon of um that and city lights are like two of the ones you have to see for Chaplin. but yeah no this movie was a lot of fun you know and but for me it was really just almost more than anything like you said just knowing in your the back of your mind that it's him doing everything right. and even the little stuff that seems so like when he's just sitting on the on the engine and it goes up and it turns him up and around and, and it's super slow it's not like it's going fast you know but you just sit there and you go It'd be so easy to get your shirt tail caught in that thing and then have like a tragedy on your hands. Well, they, um, sh- they show it in a documentary I watched that if those wheels spun, which they did a lot, mm-hmm, yeah. if they spun out and didn't catch, the speed of that thing would have knocked them through the air and probably killed them. Oh, Just wow. Just taking them off that rail, taking them off that, that uh, yeah. sidebar. Exactly. At least he had all of his fingers on like Harold Lloyd. It was right. really, uh, but it, but it's a great film, you know, and it does it does suffer from kind of like the, you know, it, you know, the plotting is pretty straightforward, you know, and, but that's kind of expected at, at, of movies at that time. They weren't very long and, uh, but just really just watching it. And the other thing was it does. And, and I'm glad they, obviously they found a beautiful print of it because the, it looks fantastic. And it's amazing that that movie's what, like close to a hundred years old. Yeah. And it looks as good as it does still. Um, I think it just it goes to show you like, a good quality film print still is the best thing you yeah. can, you can have pretty much. Um, anyway, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really fun. Um, but like I said, you know, at the same time, you're just kind of watching for these amazing stunts and yeah, that sequence I hit on the, on the front of the engine when he just throws that split rail, which like you said, that had to be not light. Like in the right. part of my mind, I was like, did they make it out of balsa wood or something like that? But he tossed it and it yeah. hits it and it just knocks it off just at exactly the right moment. Uh, one other thing about the stunt, since you brought up stunts, there was a scene where they uh, filled the, the uh, train with water and it went all over the actress. They didn't tell her that was going to happen, so she had her back to it. And when he pulled that and all that water came down, that was her real reaction to that because she didn't know that was going to happen. She was ticked off at Keaton, but Keaton wanted that reaction. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's obviously, a, you know, a truly a, a great piece of movie history, but at the same time, just a really amazing piece of filmmaking. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I was happy to watch it. It was good. I've seen this film a number of times. This was a, the best print, and the score was really magnificent, too. This was, wait a second. If someone else could jump in, I have a little grandson to take care of. <laughs> uh, D- Ralph, because I know Drew's seen it. I want to hear from you, Ralph. We're professionals here. What, what, what's what's the Nutella? What's going on here? Unbelievable. <laughs> it's all right. Let him do what he's got to do. What do you think? All right, I'll I'll jump in. Um, you know, it's a good. It's it's from filmmaking point of view, fantastic. I I can't even argue. William Friedkin said it's the greatest chase film he's ever seen. Yeah. He modeled if he could. He said if in French Connection, if he could come close to it. Buster Keaton did, then his chase scene was going to be successful. The only thing this did for me, and you know, like I said, I'm a Buster Keaton. I like the idea of Buster Keaton as far the picture I have behind me is him at an editing table, which just represents how I feel about what he does. Sherlock he is, Jr., I think, isn't it? I yeah, that's what, Sherlock Jr. Yeah. He's wearing the hat you're wearing, I think. Yeah. Um, what it did for me, what it did for me, because again, I'm sitting there going, hey, we're rooting for the South on this I one. I think he even I had a rebel flag at one point that he was. Yeah. He did. And, you know, and there, people are dying left and right. <laughs> um, but what I did do, what, what it did do for me is that I went down the rabbit hole on YouTube after I watched this film to, to just get glimpses into who this person was. And 
I was both saddened, like you said, about what happened to him after, but also very impressed with his rise and where he came from, vaudeville. He was a little kid yeah. with his parents and, and his whole life story. And the fact that a lot of the Three Stooges bits, either he was, I couldn't quite get it, he was repeating them or they were repeating his. I think he was repeating theirs, they, right? No, he was before them. Yeah, but wasn't he in his later life? Wasn't he kind of doing some He of went their to shtick? Columbia. He was... He went to Columbia and had a series of shorts that other people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he also worked as a gag writer on like um, Marx Brothers films. And right, all. right, right. You could see like Go West where they had the big train gag at the end too. It was definitely. But it's just so people. sad. You know, what made me sad is you look at a guy with this kind of talent and then he goes to MGM wherever he went and they're, they're pigeonholing him. They don't want to let him do what he's great at, what, at doing. And, it, you know, it's just, it's a little, it's a little melancholy. And then they then they teamed him up with Jimmy Durant. I saw, yeah, I saw that too. And, you know, so, but the filmmaking and the the editing of this film, you know, it's brilliant. It, 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 I can't deny that. Would I ever watch it again? Probably not. Would I, do I like silent films? I do not. I just, they're, they're, the whole idea of him, the reason he was going into the, he, he wanted to sign up was for his girlfriend who was just treating him like a piece of crap. And then, and then I start thinking about, okay, he lives through all his stunts, but how many people does he kill doing his stunts? Like that poor woman she had in the bag, when he, he, you see her throw her in the bag, in the back, I think she's in that bag, and then people are throwing stuff on him. Maybe that wasn't. But when he comes in and gets her out of the bag, he's flopping all over her, yeah. stepping all over. It's like, how many people die in these things that they don't talk about? And I just like the fact that that scene of the bridge... That was the most expensive scene ever shot in a silent film. That's yeah. fascinating stuff too. And the whole town was there to watch it. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine. And they didn't. That train stayed in that river until World War II, I think. Yeah. So yeah. and they used it for scrap metal. Yeah. Right? Um, so yeah, the technique and his technique, I'm fascinated by. You know, then you start seeing all the other clips that obviously the house falling on him and all oh, his yeah. stunts that he does. Mm -hmm. So it, it sent me down that hole, which I appreciated. Again, but while I'm watching the film, it just they're too. I just can't get, I can't get into that 1921 head frame. 26. 26, where these people are all thrilled by a train coming at me. It's amazing. But that's just being rude. I mean, you know. <laughs> well, it was a little more than a train coming at you. I understand. Come on. I understand. Don't undersell it. So, anyway. But I, I, I would recommend the film. I think it's one that should be watched. And, Let me ask uh, you this. Would it make you see another film of his or just wrap? Like, they, there's all kinds of YouTubes on his best stunts. Would you watch that? But you maybe, watch maybe. But film? I would also like to see. You said there's a uh, film of his life or something, which you said yeah, isn't Donald good. But I would still no. And then I started thinking because I watched the holdovers, right? Yeah. And I started thinking the kid in the holdovers, although he's way too tall, because Buster Keaton looked pretty short. Um, the kid in the holdovers could play Buster Keaton. He has that. Look. Well, that's an interesting idea, what? Dominic Sessa. Yeah, as Buster Keaton. Yeah, he's I got that him look. I that rather than the holdovers. I know you don't like the holdovers. I love the holdovers, but I thought that kid would be a good Buster Keaton for some reason. That's what I was thinking about. Again, rooting for the South. I didn't quite yeah. like too much. No, um, I felt the same way about that. It's hard yeah. to get your mind around that, really. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that scene where he's up there and he's got the stars and bars, and even though he trips with it and he falls down right. with it. You know, you're just like, mm, yeah. Am I really, why am I what? rooting for them shooting? Oh, wait, they they might be shooting at my relatives for all I know. I don't know, right? <laughs> exactly. It's like so, but I would still recommend the film, and it did make me more interested in Buster Keaton than I was three days ago. So I appreciate that. Well, that's good. That yeah. that makes me happy. Yeah. So I mean, can I check and see if my grandson's here? No. Okay. <laughs> so um, you know, um, I've seen this film many times. Um, you know, they talk about the big three silent comics. I would include some other ones, but um, Chaplin, Keaton, and Lloyd. And they're all very good. I think Lloyd took a long time to find who his character was. And um, he's only, I think Lloyd is only as good as the, as the gags in the film. Now, I think, you know, Keaton is more inherently fun. I think of the three, Chaplin is the funniest, and he's the one I, I watch most. But you're right about Keaton. He is the most, the best filmmaker yeah. and the most experimental filmmaker. Chaplin, as you had a very static frame, but he wanted it that way because right. 
he wanted the audience to see the entire him essentially. Right. And um, the general is one of my favorite um, Keaton features. And um, I would say there were like three, three films I would recommend for people who've never seen a silent film. They're all comedies. And one would be the gold rush, you know, I, cause I really don't count city lights or uh, modern times as silence for Chaplin and the general for Keaton and, um, Safety last for Harold Lloyd. That's the one where he, the gold rush is Chaplin, you know, going, you know, into the frozen North, a lot of great comic sequences and, um, and safety last is Harold Lloyd climbing a building. And that's another one of those. Thrillers. Is that the clock one? Yeah. The hanging from the, clock. Hanging yeah. from the clock. Yeah. He remade it as a sound film, but it wasn't as effective when you can hear him screaming and everything, <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, it takes away the humor, but, um, this this was an excellent choice. I'm kind of sorry you brought the uh, first silent film to the piece, um, John, rather than me. He was just trying to feel... clear the palette. We've had way too many, you know, depressing films. I know so. what kind of yeah. films we've been having, and uh, and but you know, this would definitely be one I would recommend. Though usually I would recommend a short. I really loved Keaton's short Cops. Oh yeah, great, excellent, and Chaplin's Easy Street you know, I think are also very, are excellent entrees into silent films. But if you're going to go into silent films, you, um, you couldn't do better. A lot of people at the time went for the Southern side because they didn't feel that in studios, they didn't feel that the Southerners would see a movie that really glorified the Union. And meanwhile, the North didn't care. When you're the winner, you don't care. You know yeah, what right. I mean? It's sort of yeah. like- That's a good point. You know, I never even thought The of Northerners that. didn't have all these lingering resentments about the war. You know, so a lot of Hollywood studios would, you know, and, and hoping to get the widest audience possible would um, favor to, you know, to tell a Southern story rather than a Northern one. And um, one thing I really enjoyed about this as a screenwriter is um, a lot of a lot of silent comedy is really haphazard. You know, it's a it's a basically there's usually a story, but it's basically they follow a series of gags. Right, exactly. But this, this is a really well-structured film with a beginning, a middle, and end. And, you know, it has what, you know, a lot of people say is always perfect in a film. It has a midpoint reversal. Because the first half of the film is ultimately him chasing the train. And then and then he gets the train back, at, you know, a little after the midpoint, and they're chasing him. So it's like a, it's a beautifully structured um, film for 1926. And... Um, if why I would why I would probably favor as a comedy um, the Gold Rush or um, say even Safety Last is because to me this is more of an adventure film. This is more of like an action yeah, film. I, I think it's very funny, but it's definitely more of an action film than than a comedy. You know, it's it's an it, there's a lot of adventure and all. So there's war and there's a lot of and it's really stunt heavy. You know, it's a um, yeah, but I there's a lot of gags in this, Sean. Print. I mean, we're talking about the. I was just want to say we're talking about the print currently available on Prime, and a great score and a great print, and I definitely recommend people seeing it. And you know, MGM was the place comics went to die. Yeah. Now, MGM was good at doing like romantic comedy or you know, or dramas that had comedy in them, but if you look at, I mean, what they did to Keaton was unconscionable. I mean, it was horrible what they did to Keaton. But it is it's like what they did. Look what they did with the Marx brothers. When the Marx brothers right. they were chaotic and hilarious and archaic at um Paramount. And then the first two films were okay, but the rest of the films they made during the forties were, you know, were, you know, it would they were just you know, they were just, you know, just you know, really watered down and destroyed. And if you look at it like the little rascals, which are a Hal Roach um thing, you know, and they were great at Hal Roach and they dealt with kid stuff. But then MGM wanted to run the series themselves. And they and also at Hal Roach, they aged the kids out quick. But MGM kept, kept the kids older and they became more serious and they weren't as good. And if you look at Laurel and Hardy as well, they were also kind of destroyed by MGM. At Hal Roach, they were great. Um, MGM released Hal Roach films, so there's a connection. But when Laurel and Hardy left Hal Roach, they started doing features directly for... Um, directly for MGM and those films were all pretty bad, you know, because once again, like Keaton, they wouldn't let, they wouldn't let Laurel and Hardy have much input into their films. You know, it's like, okay, you're the actor. Don't worry. We got these writers. And, you know, if you were, it's like Keaton, 
It doesn't matter who's also his name is as director. On a Keaton film, Keaton is essentially making every decision. And his co-director is just a guy to tell him, yeah, you were in frame, you know, Buster. You know what I mean? I mean, he had writers, he had gag men and all, but that's what they did. And it's the same way with like Laurel and Hardy. It didn't matter who was directing a Laurel and Hardy short film or short at Hal Roach. It was always Stan calling the shots. Well, they used to let Keaton, Keaton always develop gags on the spot. Yeah. You know, during a film and yeah. they wouldn't, everything had to be scripted out. They wouldn't let him do that anymore. Yeah, which that's what Chaplin Keaton told him not to do it. Chaplin yeah. said, this is a big mistake. Don't do it. Yeah. It's really, it, it's really sad. And I'm just so happy that, um, you know, he had a, a renaissance at the end and he did that nice, really nice short film for the Canadian railroad. That system, experimental like, film, movie, you know, and, yeah. um, he, he, he managed to enjoy some glory at the end of his, um, at the end of his life, which I'm very glad. That, well, glad those he, beach movies introduced him to an entire yeah, young the audience. Party, um, you've been going all Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm glad, you know, he was like totally, and I wouldn't say totally, but he went from being one of the highest paid stars in Hollywood to be like $150 a week gag man, you know, for a while. So, um, well, he had a gigantic he lost, mansion, he like pretty much lost and, and he became an alcoholic. He was probably difficult to, um, work with him for a while. He had a lot of personal heartbreak and tragedy as well. He also got his name from Houdini. If you didn't know that he's the one that yeah. pen, uh, so, pegged the name Buster. Yeah. yeah. I so. Yep. I, I love this film. I am so glad. And I sort of like, it's a long time since I've watched it beginning to end all the way through again. I do have the um, very nice Buster Keaton box set that has all the features on it and all. And it makes me really want to take a deep dive. I definitely want to see the one that Ralph was talking about. You know, Sherlock Jr. again, where he's at the editing table. He's a projectionist. Yeah. What they were doing in that film was amazing. You know, the way they had to um, do double images to have him stepping from one situation into another in the same frame. You know, what they had to think, and they had to do it all practically, too. He walked out of the movie screen. Yeah, like he walked Purple in. The, but when he was in the movie screen, yeah. sometimes the scene would change and he would be exactly in the same right. place. That's right. In, they used survey there. equipment. And they would, they would like, draw the little things over yeah. it. And, you know, it, and, man, they... they what you had to do in the old days to do stuff we just do so easily now. Mm. And it was genius that they were able to pull it off. And what was the one where, um, I forgot what it was called, the, the one where he goes south and they want to kill him and they have that hurricane and that building falls on him. Oh, yeah, falls, yeah, yeah. Um, he would have been dead, you know. So he he really did. Is that Steamboat? Thing. Is that Steamboat Junior? Mm, um, is that Steamboat I think it's Jr.? Tenet. Tenant. Tenant, yes. All right. All right, let Drew get a couple. Oh, let we Drew, haven't heard Drew's words. Yeah, let Drew yet. get a couple words in here. Yeah, sorry. I just love Buster Keaton. I'll say. So I have seen this movie before. I own it on DVD, and the uh, transfer uh, and music is is very good. I haven't seen the newer version. I'm sure the restoration is amazing, and I am always – just kind of curious to see how these movies play with different scores and i don't feel as precious about them like if i watch star wars i don't need you to put in the matrix score type of thing but these movies existed in a different kind of environment so it's kind of interesting if somebody wants to write a score today uh, I, i'm curious i don't know that it'll be better but i it, it interests me um i like that this movie has all these different things that um are still still seen and used as some of the most effective ways to show action in movies today, almost a hundred years later. I think that's great. And like using wide shots for action scenes. So you can see the stunt work, you can see the fight choreography. Uh, I don't know if you saw at the Oscars, they uh, still don't have an Oscar for stunt work, but uh, they did, uh, I guess, coming. to promote the fall guy and um, uh, Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt did a little stunt montage thing, which early in the montage, had a uh, ramen beam from RRR backflipping onto the guard tower. So I enjoyed that, but um, <laughs> that, 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 uh, that showed a lot of the, you know, movies just recently older movies, all this kind of stuff. And I remembered that um, when uh, Tom Cruise and Christopher McQuarrie were talking about making what became the last mission impossible movie, dead reckoning, they basically, I think they kind of start by saying, cause they don't really have scripts when they start shooting. They were like, well, what do you want to do? And Tom Cruise was like, I want to ride a motorcycle off a cliff and have a parachute. What do you want to do, Chris? And Chris McQuarrie was like, I want to throw a train off a bridge. And 
that's what he did. And that was amazing 98 years ago. And it's still amazing today. And yes, they threw a real train off a real bridge and then they did a lot of things digitally and, and whatever, but that doesn't make it any less of a real train going off of a real bridge. And so I think it's kind of interesting that movies have the same, the same kinds of things as, as different and as amazing as movies have been in a hundred years, they, they still can touch the same buttons in the same way. And of course, I mean, this is a there and back again movie, like I think Sean said, and um, there's a direct line from this movie to Mad Max Fury Road in so many <laughs> different ways, in the practical stunt work, in the structure of the story, in the... Um, yeah, that's a reversal too, midpoint reversal. Yeah, I mean, it's but except that I guess in the general, they, he knows he's going to turn it around. And in Fury Road, you, they and you, the audience, you don't expect them to hit their destination and it's already gone. The green place is gone. And they're like, what do we do? And they say, you know what? We got to go back. And that is so simple and so compelling. And it's the same thing in the general, especially because you're running from someone, you're turning around, you're going back at them. That is, you're the ballsiest or the dumbest or a little bit of both. And in both of those movies, it's very, um, uh, it's a very, visceral feeling of watching them make that choice and start that choice because they're really going right back into the jaws of the monster. And I, I don't know, I was thinking about the, um, like it and, doesn't bother and me. Max that, never smiled in that's Fury true. Road. So. That's true. That's true. He did not true? smile. He never smiles. He doesn't say much. Know. He's not a, quite a silent movie actor, but he doesn't say much. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. That's all right. And it doesn't bother me that it was about the South. I think you could probably say that the South did win the Civil War. They definitely won Reconstruction. Dixie survived. Slavery survived as Jim Crow. So, you know, we didn't really win that much anyway. But I do think it's interesting what you just said about um, how they thought the South wouldn't watch a movie where they were the bad guy. I, that, that seems credible to me. Uh, because, you know, they had all those feelings about the what do they call the recent unpleasantness and all that yeah. kind of nonsense. Uh, just as an aside, this also reminded me, and maybe Ralph, if you haven't seen this, you'll like this one uh, even better. There's another movie that's black and white called The General from 1998 by John Borman with Brendan Gleeson and John Voight. And Brendan Gleeson plays Marty Cahill, who was an IRA guy and a bank robber. And John Voight is the cop who's trying to get it. And uh, I hadn't watched that in ages. And so I, I also have that on DVD because you can't get that anywhere. And so I watched that again. So that was like a nice thing that reminded me to watch that. Because that's, that's also a kind of crazy comedy movie as well, because Marty Cahill would plan these elaborate bank robberies that would succeed. But when he would set them in motion, he would put on a hoodie and go sit in the lobby of the police station. And so, like, I didn't do it. I've been here the whole time kind of thing. So, I mean, Buster Keaton certainly showed an awful lot of personality, uh, you know, without saying anything, which is still an impressive kind of thing. And you know, George Miller's movies, they could they could be largely silent as well. Yeah. These pure, sort of pure action movies yeah, exactly. and the way that he shoots the action, the way that the Buster Keaton shoots the action is a direct line from that to George Miller, to the guys who make uh, the John Wick movies, like any of these kinds of things where you go, they're really doing it. And yes, you know, it's a movie, so it's not real. And yes, you know that they maybe they didn't do it against that background or something. But, you know, Keanu Reeves is in his 50s and he's really doing jujitsu and he's really doing that fall and that the, all these other people are doing that stuff. And that doesn't lose any power 100 years later, which I think is really neat. Well, like I said, and that Friedkin, that, uh, that that split rail scene. Yeah, man, that's yeah. crazy. And Freakin said it's a direct line to French Connection Chase. I mean, direct mm -hmm. line. Oh, yeah. If he could get half of what Keaton did, he thought he was happy. And of course, he, he well, did. he also so, said in that in that interview, he goes, if I had gone six seconds too long, it would have ruined the chase. That's why when he saw the general, he goes, the editing on this was so perfect for the chase. Uh, he, you know what? I, I felt the opposite. He was blowing his own. He's blowing his own horn on that one. If I had stayed a half a second, he said literally said an eighth of a second. And you see the camera move. That's going to throw the whole thing off. But I'm such a genius that I knew exactly where to make the cut. I mean, it does. Well, like I, that. I, mean, I didn't read it that way. Oh, he I was, did. I did. No, he yeah. was I trying. Him. Listen, he was trying to say how precise it all. I what know. Keaton achieved. And he goes, it was very difficult to do because one mistake, one second or two seconds, then it, it, it blows it, which Keaton no, did he not said do. an eighth of a second. He didn't say well, one that was or two one seconds. example. He said an eighth of a second. I watched the same one. <laughs> well, he also... Freakin Freakin did Sorcerer, right? Yeah. 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 So Sorcerer is is a remake of Wages of Fear, which is another movie that is um very focused and incredibly intense. And I remember the first time that I watched that movie, it was probably in college or something. I thought 
like the first, I guess, an hour or so. I'm like, this is kind of dull. Like, none of these guys are really that interesting. And and what's what? Like, I'm, I don't know that I even really care about them. And then they put the nitroglycerin in the truck and go to close the. And it's unbelievable. Right. And it's, it's another one. Like, it's not. Right. It's not. Uh, Why you know, It's it? not spaceships and and aliens and giant special effects and and sky beams and all that kind of stuff. It's just like men and machines. Mm-hmm. For real. And so I'm not surprised that William Friedkin would want to remake that movie. I'm not surprised yeah. that he would, you know, be very conscious of um, the general when he's making well, he uh, French a- Connection. And I'm not surprised he would be impressed with himself yeah. as yeah. when he's discussing it. That, and he's a historian of film. I mean, he's, you know, he was. Yeah, well, he loves, he loves steeped movies. Steeped in it, yeah. So um, what else? Anything else? What's the rating? I mean, yeah. Well, a. Watch your hands. It'll change your picture. <laughs> yeah, I'm even. Gonna, I'm even going to say of Yippie all films ever okay. made. I, I mean, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. I think. I mean, it's one of those you have to see before you die. I think. Yeah. And you should. I think so. um, again, true. I wouldn't. I don't seek out these films like the Charlie Chaplin and all that. But um, being forced to watch this was fun because I I went and did other. I looked at other things that made me that were interesting. So I appreciated that. So. I really yeah. wonder if they'll ever make. Not that they can't try, but if they'll ever make. Um, a decent biopic of Buster Keaton because you know a lot of these guys. I think Babylon tried to show the lives of some of these type of people, including with some you know like that's clearly Fatty Arbuckle, that kind of stuff. Right. But um, you know, it, it, I, like I I think I've seen Chaplin that Robert Downey Jr. was in. I remember not much about it. I remember nobody being particularly impressed, and I feel like that's not. He was not. It doesn't have to be that way because these guys really. I mean, they built the movies. And you, they were the actors and the creative forces. The, the people at that time watched them build the movies. And you know, I, it would also be kind of fun to have you know Buster Keaton sit down and watch Fury Road and get his thoughts on it. But I'm sure it's, he would have liked it's it. I think he would. I mean, because it's like that. How did you do that? But I yeah. know how you did it. You had fucking giant balls, and you put up a camera and you did it. Yeah, and, it's what you know, Tom this Cruise movie is, is full of. Like, that. It's what Tom Cruise is doing now. You're like, well, how can he do that? And that, yeah. And that, you, you talk about that simple thing on the split when he's sitting on that rail that could have gone bad really quickly. That's right. And, you know, I, obviously he has he, he plans everything to the to the nth degree, or at least that's the impression I got. Except some of that when I was watching some of the YouTube, he made like you were saying, he made stuff up on the day of the shoot like they would set up, you know, I mean, I think that was more sight gaggy stuff and more kind of, you know, changing clothes in a closet or something like that. But those big ones, he must have spent hours just planning even even as simply like you mentioned the water pouring on that woman you know if that goes wrong she's thrown off the side of the train yeah. you know so that has to be meticulously he did a stunt he did a stunt i don't it wasn't this film it was another film where he was hanging from a water spout and, and the back. water gushed down and he, he broke his went neck down he yeah but he never knew that for years later he uh he went to the doctor and the guy said when did you break your neck he goes i've never broken my neck he goes wow. yeah you broke your neck and it was like years yeah. later. Well, it broke, so, his ankles were oh. busted. I mean, yeah, know, obviously he he hurt himself, but Buster. But as a kid, that's that's why they named him because he was flopping himself around. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, you don't get Jackie Chan without that kind of attitude. That's, you don't get yeah. all of these physical. No, I don't know how they do it. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing. Plus, I mean, Jackie Chan. You understand. You look at that and you go, "All right, well." I think they have some different safety standards in some different countries. That doesn't mean that Jackie Chan is always going to die or anything, but there's a reason that he. Uh, includes the um, the That's reel right. during the credits of him getting yeah. injured. Like in Rumble in the Bronx, he broke his ankle yeah. and had yeah. to wear a cast. So they just made him a cover that looked like a sneaker. And yeah. so he wore his sneakers and still did action scenes. And I don't know that they would have let him do that if they shot it in, you know, on the back lot at Warner Brothers or something. Yeah. Well, Cruz busted his ankle in one of the Mission Impossible. Yeah, in the in Fallout, he did yeah. uh, he did a jump. And the take that's in the movie, the take where he breaks his ankle, you don't see the take where he where he breaks it. But when it cuts to him, like he's kind of uh, he bumps into the side of the building and he pulls himself up and walks away. And he, when he limps away, that is the broken in ankle. character. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, that's the thing. Like Tom Cruise is what it doesn't really matter whether you like him or not personally. And it almost doesn't matter whether you like his movies or not. The guy is movies. Yeah. And, absolutely. you know, Buster Keaton is like that, too. 
Like this is this is a guy who's he's doing what he's here to do. It doesn't always right. work because movies are so subjective, but you can't say they didn't go for it again and again and again. And you know, it's nice to see that that's the kind of thing that has driven this industry again for a hundred yeah. years. Yeah. Well, they showed a direct line to that shot you're talking about. Keaton did the same thing. Of course, they did it, and Damon did it in his uh, Born movie too, where he jumped from mm, yeah, where he ceiling jumps roof, across the, roof to, yeah. to, to window. So yeah, that window, was, yeah. and they did a direct line to that shot with buster keaton and tom cruise so that's again that's yeah, i want to find that montage that they showed because that was a nicely um assembled look at, at the Star oscars Park. yeah that was nicely done the in memoriam on the other hand annoyed right. me, but that's another thing that's you know what i'm sorry but while the in memoriam upsets me every year there's no way they could there, there's no way they're ever going to win that's yeah, that is a exactly. losing no, no they yeah. used to do it in the 90s and it was just a film and it was always beautiful, you know, but now they're too, including too many people. It's sort of like, oh, Bloom, the lawyer died. And I've heard of him, Jake Bloom. He's <laughs> a power thing, but it's like. Well, know. they put like another 40 names up in the circle at the end. I mean, yeah. you can't even read those names. So. Yeah. At least they didn't do the thing that I don't like, which is they start clapping. And I'm like, are you clapping because you like them and you recognize them and you don't recognize the other guys? So that feels rude. They're are finally you clapping dead because you're glad they're dead. They're which finally is also dead. Legitimate. Yeah, yeah I, I, the, well, the audience you know, was, was the like, audience was couth enough. It was sort that. of like when the head of Columbia, Harry Cohen, died and there was a huge crowd of people there. And somebody said, I can't believe all these people are here. And the guy goes, hey, it's Hollywood. When you give the people what they want. They show up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> he was like the most wow. hated. Man. Ryan Gosling took the show with his. I am. Oh my god, I that was yeah. fantastic. That was hilarious. <laughs> it's too bad not everybody saw that movie to understand what's going on. But okay, all right. So, uh... <laughs> well, I don't think you have to have seen the movie to still see that that is something exhilarating. It was fun. exhilarating. It was just great. Little diamonds are uh, diamonds are a girl's best friend. Uh, He's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Ryan Gosling is awesome. All yes, right, let's uh, let's quickly quickly do a round of what you watch. Um, and then we'll get to this spin. We have three of us left, I believe, on the spin. So, right, yeah. So, uh, Chris, you had a lot of time off. What'd you watch? Uh, two things I'll talk about real quick. I actually went to the movies and I saw Dune Part Two um, one week late. And I'll be honest with you, I was really looking forward to it because oh. Dune Part One grew on me. But unfortunately, Dune Part Two left me a little flat. Wait, well, like, back up. When you say Dune Part One grew on you, did you not like it when you first saw it? Is that what you mean by? Uh, on the very first part? time I saw Dune Part One when it came out in the theater, I had a hard time with it. As many of you have I maybe mentioned before, I love David Lynch's Dune. Um, I've read oh. the book from cover to cover multiple times and pieces of it dozens of times. So but I got what it took me a little while to get into Dune Part One to get to did, Villeneuve was trying to basically take away a lot of like the, um, you know, the language and all the weird stuff going on to try to strip that all away to just get to the story to not distract the audience, because I think one of the big criticisms of David Lynch's Dune was he tried to pack all of that detail and all of that world building culture into one thing and everybody just a lot of people got overloaded i mean i was 11 when i saw it and i got it but hey whatever I uh, loved it. you know i mean i really thought it was but but anyway long story short is so the second one comes out and it just fell a little flat for me now maybe if i when i watch it again and i will um maybe it'll 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 come back for me or, or whatever but there were some really interesting choices made in it um, there was some changes that they made and normally, you know, I try not to get too precious about stuff like that, but like, I just, you know, I would have made some different ones. Was it a bad movie? No, it's beautiful. Um, it's well acted, all of that stuff. Um, but there was just a couple of things where I was like, eh, and I'll be honest with you, a few of the characters, I really felt like if they had put them in Dune part one, it would have made more, it would have made their appearance and their effect on the story in Dune part two, much more, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, impact. Well, do you think this will have the same impact? Probably not. The answer is probably no. As Lord of the Rings, because this is going to be a trilogy, right? They're going to do three of these. That's what well, they say you're doing. And they're adding actors to each each time. Like yeah. you're saying, there were the mm -hmm. actors were not in one or in two, so people yeah, are wanting I mean, to be in the. They want to be in the in the film, sure. right? Yeah, and I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, Frank Herbert alone wrote six books, so okay. you know they could keep going with this. And the interesting thing is do the second dune book dune messiah is a much shorter book so you could legitimately do that in just one in one go you wouldn't like have to the or three like <laughs> well, the you could break it up yeah you can just keep well, breaking the, the problem with the problem with doing dune messiah i also saw um 
Dune Part Two this weekend as well. Then the second weekend, I went and saw mm-hmm. it on Friday night. And um, Dune at the end of Dune, there's uh, uh, Paul. Uh, the, the it's in the movie that the the lands are out, the houses are in orbit, and Paul is basically I'm going to marry Florence Pugh. I'm going to become the emperor, and they oppose mm-hmm. it, so we're going to war. And so what happens is a jihad across the stars and 60 billion, 61 billion people die. Yeah. And there's a 12 year jump between the end of Dune and the beginning of Dune Messiah. And in that 12 years is when that whole jihad happens. Exactly. And then we're back at the palace hanging out and it's a much smaller movie. So if you go to, uh, you know, Fellowship of the Ring and Two Towers and you're like, these movies are gigantic and this one's bigger than that one, then the Return of the King is going to be the biggest. And the, Dune is not structured like that. Yeah. And if they keep making movies, it's just going to get weirder. Like, oh, look, it's Paul's son and he's putting sand trout on him and he's turning into a worm for a thousand years. And like no, nobody's going to want to see that as a movie the same way they have been attracted to these movies. And I yeah. saw the first one um, in my living room, in my den because it was the year of COVID that Warner mm-hmm. Brothers put everything out. So I didn't actually see the first one in the theater. And I, I thought that was, the theater for that. yeah, I thought that was probably a disservice to it. I, I thought it was okay, but it, it, and it didn't even make me angry, but it was definitely a half of a movie. Yeah. And I felt that very acutely, even though at the end of the day, I was like, it's just the beginning. It felt like it just stopped instead of ended. Even the Lord of the Rings movies, they have, arcs that end characters that have resolution different things like that and so i finally was like all right i'm gonna watch the second half i'm gonna watch the end of it and i thought like you said chris they made a lot of choices and stripped away things and some of what they stripped away i think isn't just the the weirdness or the culture it really pulls apart what makes the story Mm -hmm. work because you know in the in the book he takes years and he trains the fremen to be fighters and and in that time his sister is born like if you're watching that movie and you're like, what the hell, what, what, who's talking to a fetus? I don't understand what's happening. None of that is explained or paid off. Mm-hmm. They have a flash forward to a surprise cast member, you know, in a vision of that of that character, which is great. I think she's yeah. wonderful, but uh, you know, and Alicia Witt was great in the Lynch movie, but I feel like it's, it's, it's almost like it's too simple. It's not really about what it thinks it's about. And that kind of frustrated me because they kept yeah. saying, well, the prophecy is a lie and maybe you shouldn't believe it. And then over and over and over, Stilgar, somebody's like, it's the truth. And then he's like, well, it might not be true, but then he does it anyway. Yeah. And you kind of don't get a sense of how he feels about it. But the way that they changed um, Chani's fate at the end, making, mm-hmm. giving her a lot more power was interesting. Now, all that said, the movie looks amazing. Yes. Like really amazing. Yeah. And I have not seen Elvis. I have not seen a lot of Austin Butler movies. He plays Fade uh, Rautha, who is uh, staying in the in the Lynch version. He is spectacular. He Good. I'm steals the whole movie. Oh my God! He, he he. There's a little bit of Elvis in his uh, in his performance, frankly. But he <laughs> he wakes up the movie in a way. And the the scene where you first meet him is set on uh, his family's the Harkonnens, and that's their planet, which has a black sun. And so I'm watching the movie, and I'm like, this isn't this is black and white. And you can see that in some of the trailers and stuff. But it's not really black and white. I was wondering, did they shoot it with like thermal cameras or something? But it doesn't look like special forces you know, video of a raid type of thing. They shot it with infrared cameras. Hmm. So it doesn't look like anything that you've ever seen before, even though you've seen gladiator fights and you've seen black and white footage and things like that. And it's it's so striking. And uh, even like they have fireworks on this planet with a black sun and the fireworks are like black bubbles that explode in the sky. Like it's so alien and sufficiently weird and different. But yep. Fade Rautha, I mean, he commands the screen and he is uh he's just a like an incredible creation so it's not uh, my favorite version of dune as a movie but i'm glad i saw it six out of ten and um it's not it's definitely still not my favorite villeneuve movie but if he makes another one i i'm i'm almost more curious to see what he'll choose to do with it than to actually mm-hmm. see it because it's going to be so different but I, I can't imagine they won't make one i mean this one's making money the last one won like seven oscars this one will certainly win the score is even better the yeah. special effects all that kind of stuff so Okay, well, that was Chris's What'd You Watch. <laughs> All right. uh, Chris, did you want to finish anything? Or Oh, n- no, I will say this, though. What's interesting about it is is to just kind of put this in some perspective about the books. Is Dune, the book, was a, was a hit when it was finally published as a single novel. Um, it was originally serialized. Um, 
But interestingly enough, nobody wanted to publish the sequel that that Herbert wrote because it was so different than the first one that it also ended up having to be serialized in a in a magazine, a science fiction magazine, but not even the science fiction magazine that uh, Dune was originally serialized. Even those editors were like, yeah, this isn't what we want, man. (laughs) And so it was like a second rate, not second rate, but maybe second tier sci fi magazine that it was serialized in. Um, it is. I've had for I have had friends that love the book who've literally read the first five to ten pages of the second book and never picked it up again. Yeah, it's different. It's very different. I think and I, I went be, through four books, four of them, I think. I've read oh, I've read all of the ones that Herbert wrote. So yeah, I would skip the other some ones. of the other ones too, which are just whatever. Yeah, his son wrote and co-wrote some stuff. And it's not good. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, I'm all done. Okay, uh, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. I watched um, the heat of the in the heat of the night with um, Rod Steiger and um, Sidney Poitier. Poitier. Sidney Poitier, and I, you know, there were a lot in the period, you know, late fifties through sixties, a lot of quote unquote like race films. You'd say like the Defiant ones, you know, look who's coming to dinner, and sort of they're not all Sidney Poitier. There was also like Harry Belafonte in the World of Flesh and the Devil, and like of all these films where like you know they have a strong um, African American character. I do think that In the Heat of the Night is the best of them. It's a really good story. It's a very tight script. It's directed very well. And, um, you know, Rod Steiger is, is an interesting and complex character in the sense that he kind of is a racist, you know, but he, but he also respects the guy. And he, he's open-minded for that town. He's kind of open-minded, mm-hmm. you know. And there's, that great, there's a great scene where they go to the richest man in town who might be a suspect in a murder. And um, and this rich guy who owns like all these cotton fields and all gets questioned by Sidney Portier and he slaps him, he slaps Sidney Portier across the face and Sidney Portier just slaps him back, and the sheriff's like you're like this and he's like, and he's like and the rich man turns to him did you see that he goes uh yes I I did see that what are you gonna do about it uh, I don't know <laughs> you know oh, I forgot it was the exact quote but it was like it's a really strong film Sidney Portier's um. You know, they always say he was like the saintly black man that could come into the house and teach America about race relations. But he's got an edge in this film, you know. He's, yes, he he's does. Got an, yeah, it's you great. know, so it's it's real. You know, this isn't Gus who's coming to dinner. You know, I mean, there's, mm-hmm. this is a really well, really well done film. It won, I think, best picture. I think um, Steiger mm-hmm. may have won the Oscar. I think he might have for that. You know, and um, well it's deserved. always good. It's got a nice score. It's got like Warren Oates in it. I mean, it was a good cast all around. You know, there are a number of TV actors that you would have seen from a lot of series around that time, too. So, you know, it's it's another film. Unfortunately, TCM was showing a lot of the Oscar winning films, and um, that was one always worth watching another time. Good one. John. OK, I watched two things. Uh, I watched for the first time 1940s High Sierra starring oh, Ida Lupino and Humphrey Bogart. Mm. And what's interesting about that film, I think it was the last time Humphrey Bogart was second build. Yeah. Ida Lupino was a bigger star than her. And it's funny, when you watch that movie, he plays Rory Earl, uh, a bank robber that gets out of prison. But he's get, just got, you know, he's just got such a presence compared to everybody else in the film. And you can see why he ended up what he ended up being. But I've never seen it, and I was glad to watch it. And a dog comes into it, and it's ultimately what undoes Roy Earl. Spoilers. The second thing I want to talk about, look, uh, you know that I trash that company with the mouse ears because I think they've single-handedly ruined some genres out there. I don't think there. you should do that. But. but I have to give credit where credit is due. And I personally think in the last 10 years, the best Star Wars show that's been on is The Bad Batch, which is on mm-hmm. Disney+. Plus. Yeah. It is an excellent animated Star Wars show that stays true to the original Star Wars while still building their own universe. But it's got more heart and more characterization than I would say any of the live action films in the last 10 years. It is so good, so well written. And I watched the first five episodes. Now they're dropping once a week and I'm sad because it is the last season, but I really, really love that show. And if you are a fan of star Wars, I would definitely check that out and you don't have to be a kid to enjoy the show. I'll be sure to let my overlords at Disney know. Let them know because it is yeah. it is great. Are they it overlords really or evil overlords? They're not evil overlords, Sean. I don't know why you keep saying that. So, well, well Ralph, please please thank them for the newest Disney princess, uh, Bella Baxter from Poor Things, because I am a big fan. 
Is, is, she, is that who just won? What you, yeah, that? yeah, Emma Stone won. That's Emma that's Stone. a Disney Searchlight movie. She's a Disney oh. princess. So I'm really proud of her. Excellent. She's going to be at the parks now. All right, Drew, do you want to talk about anything you watched? Or... He yeah, went I 20 watched, minutes um, on Dune. Cut the crap. I watched, um, I watched Mean Girls. <laughs> The, uh, oh, the musical, musical version. Yeah. Okay. Um, I really like the original movie. Uh, I haven't seen that in years. I did not see the uh, the stage show of um, of this movie. Um, it's weird the way they advertised it. I remember I didn't. I saw it like it's on I don't know, Peacock or Paramount or something. I saw. I watched it this weekend, but I wasn't. I wasn't even sure it was a musical when I first saw the ads, which was kind of odd. But uh, it's a really it's good. It's a nice movie. Uh, the music is, uh, there's a couple of scenes and songs that are really good. Um, it's, uh, it's telling the same story with the same characters. It's not trying to copy it or outdo it. It's just like, it's a musical, so it's different. And some mm-hmm. of the stuff that they do is very creative. I've, my, I've heard that some of the most popular songs from the show itself aren't in the movie. Like, you know, they don't put everything in the movie. So some of the songs that they used to introduce the actual plastics girls and stuff aren't in there, but um, I really dug it. And Renee Rapp uh, plays um, the Rachel McAdams role, Regina George, and she did the she did the last uh, Broadway. I don't think it was the Broadway or the last tour. Um, she was the lead in that show, and she's remarkable. And it was just really fun, and it's fun to see uh, Tina Fey. She has a, weird, a really great joke about being in a musical when you can't sing. So <laughs> if you liked Mean Girls, I think it's worth seeing. Um, uh, the new John Hamm's in that too, right? John he Hamm. is not a big role, but he's he's oh, an in Tim Meadows. Well, John Hamm and... is funny. He's very funny. He's very yeah, funny. Yeah, it's out. just it's just it's just nice. It's a good movie. I liked it. I've always been kind of disappointed because you know I loved um Ad Mad Men that John Hamm never really had the film career. I feel he deserves. I'm with you on that one. Yeah, yeah. he's done a lot of interesting stuff, but he has not become a major big yeah. star even though he's good in everything he's been in like well he's a major big to... star but i mean i can't put my finger on he's not he's not he TV didn't become star. bradley cooper he right. didn't become somebody who is like that's a leading man you right. know kind of thing he's great when you see him in the departed he's great when you see him in uh you know almost anything but he's never had that breakout maybe he's, he still will i don't know he's not like, he's departed. really good in uh baby driver he's but he's not the baby. lead in he's that. not in the departed yeah isn't he isn't he one of the fbi agents or something no. Alec Baldwin. I think you might be confusing. John He's Hamm's the FBI agent in um, the town. The, the town. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. That's yeah, right. Yeah, the yeah, town. Yeah, that's yeah, something here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's just town. based in Boston. They're all the same. <laughs> yeah, they all talk funny and it's all violent. Poor people. It's fine. Uh, but yes, the, Ralph. The town. How about He's you? In the town. Well, is Drew done? I sound well, like. I, I hope so. <laughs> how about you? Well, I also saw American Fiction. Do you want to talk about that? No, yes, we'll let's save that for it. next next time. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about three things quickly. Oh, okay? shit. you know what? Why uh, do I go fast anymore? I'm gonna go fast. I watched 1987's Roadhouse because the new Roadhouse oh. is coming out, and the old Roadhouse is a classic. I mean, I can't get pain. Over don't that hurt. Film. I can't get it's over that. I actually bought movie. a T-shirt that says "Be nice until you don't have to be nice anymore" because I just thought it was great. Plus, he does the MacGruber throat thing. I think it's he started that. He started. Yeah, yeah he thing. did. That's where it comes from. Yes, it's crazy. I, I hadn't seen that all the way through, and man, it's great. And I'm hearing good stuff about the new one, uh, it, it directed by and directed by Lyman. Uh, what's his name? The guy who did Doug Swinger, Lyman, Doug Lyman, Swingers, and and he's other. really pissed that they're and not the Born Identity and Edge of Tomorrow of and a lot of stuff. He's pissed. What, Sean? He's pissed that he he's was going, assured it would be released theatrically because it's an MGM film, right? And Apple bought MGM, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we're going to really really commit it to theatrical. And, you know, a lot of people aren't going to get bonuses and everything and percentages if it's not released theatrically. Yeah. And also, he's like, this is a, this tested unbelievable, and um, they're not releasing it they theatrically. Say the trailer looks great. The UFC yeah. guy, McGregor, is that his name? McGregor. Yeah, Conor McGregor. Yeah, yeah Conor McGregor. supposed to be pretty good. All right, and then I watched, I'd never seen it because I'd never seen it, uh, Jonathan Glazer's film, under the skin with scarlett johansson fantastic uh movie. john you cannot watch this film uh it's, oh, i was gonna it, bring it to it, the show well i i would love to it's unbelievable and uh you know she's Blazer, an alien who has sex with guys right no she, she, no there's a lot of penis she, does, this is <laughs> she doesn't have sex with them but... oh she absorbs them something see you just, just you gotta see it i don't want to spoil it for uh me. jonathan glazer yeah. you know he won he gave I'll a great speech last night he won for sound on zone of interest so i was happy about that one yeah i didn't love his speech and then what, after, the one where he praised, uh, he praised uh, uh, Hamas and Palestine. He didn't yeah, praise he didn't Hamas. He didn't yeah. praise Hamas. Well, oh no, no, he didn't. You're he right. He praised people, is what he. Yeah, did. That was pro-Israel. That's right. Um, 
And then the last one I watched, which I watched right after uh, The General, is I clicked over and watched Unstoppable with Denzel Washington oh. and Chris Pine. Oh, yeah. I thought about that the whole time. <laughs> yeah. I was one, awesome. of my, one of my favorite train films. I needed to clear the palette with that one. And That's man, so fun. that is such a great film. It's so good from start Wait, to Wait, I finish. want to go back to what you said, Ralph, when you said, I've never seen it because I've never seen it. Yeah, I, I was trying That's, to. I don't know what I was really getting at. I, I was trying to say I never. When it came out in 2014, I just didn't go see it for some reason. Um, <laughs> it's a weird that film. Be on a I mean, it's, it's a. Str I'm, it's, I'm not gonna lie. It's a strange film, and I had to really read about it and look at some YouTube stuff to explain what the f was going on. Um, but it's you're done with Under the Skin now. Under the Skin. No yeah, Roadhouse. Yeah. I got. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, Roadhouse. Uh, unstoppable. Now Roadhouse, I got. Ralph. <laughs> you have so. Roadhouse on Laserdisc. I don't believe I do. No, that's, that's a blue Kelly blue Lynch. Period. That's, that's a your blue, name, right? Yeah, Kelly Lynch. Lynch. Yeah. Ben Gazzara. Ben Gazzara. Yeah, I mean. Oh yeah. And, and Sam Elliott. I mean, it's just like it's chock full. And well, it has the most the most bizarre. Um, in, I'm going to intimidate you. Line in a fight for the villain to say when they're squaring off at the end. And he looks at Patrick Swayze and he goes, I used to fuck guys like you in prison. And I was like, there's well, a lot no, of that, 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 that wasn't oh the bad. That was the bad guy's henchman, the guy that was throwing the peel. Well, yeah, ben he's uh, the one like that got the throat soldier, ripped out. Yeah. He ripped his throat out after that line. Yeah. But it was it was pure Patrick Swayze. Patrick Swayze, I don't know if he had done um the dance movie yet. Uh I'm yeah, not quite sure. Dirty dancing? Yeah, I'm not yeah, quite sure. Yeah, that was after Dirty yeah. Dancing. This was after Dirty Dancing. Yeah. 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 Well, he looks exquisite. I mean, he's a skinny yeah. little guy. It's just tough. It was just a great movie, and I can't and wait. He to was see... a good martial artist too. Yeah, I can't oh, wait yeah. to see Jill and Hall do yeah. it. Do it. So yeah. it should be fun. All right, so uh, let's spin the wheel for the next person. I hope it's something I haven't seen because I haven't seen it. Uh, oh, you know what? <laughs> I'm gonna, I hope you know. I'm what? gonna Ralph. You know I what? Have, oh, you're gonna cut it out, right? No, no. I hope it's me. I'm gonna milk because that you're gonna. Um, you're gonna have to watch Under the Skin. That's okay. what's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> what's the thing? oh wow you're so you're such oh a, my throat is really he's scratchy. got a case of the chris buddy i'm feeling a little <laughs> a case of the chris that is so wrong hang on i'm chris and out of next week's episode <laughs> did you like while we're waiting chris did you like all of us strangers you know it's funny it's uh i'll be honest with you all of it, it hit me in wait wait chris problem. before you go on i have one question for you sure if you don't preface something by saying i want to be honest with you are you lying Mm. Yes, because you've mm. said that about six times tonight. Oh, have I? Okay. Yeah. Um, so no, here, yeah, I'll just give it. Let me just say that um, <laughs> I thought it was great acting. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was really great. It left me a little flat. I don't know why. I it just didn't. Uh, yeah, that's how I felt. You know, it's funny. I um, I, I will admit, I did have like a fever when I was watching it. <laughs> So, I'm not exaggerating. That, I have, is that a film over. to watch when you have a fever? That would be, or or on acid, or take a little, a take a little gummy, like, yeah. take a gummy so, before you watch it. So it was funny, like you know, when I heard when I listened to the to the show about it, I was like, I did, I kind of need to go back and watch it again because I have to admit there were all these things that that just weren't clicking, and I think part of it was because I was. I was a little bit zoned out when I was watching it because it was like <laughs> sun, was it was like out. Sunday morning. I had had a terrible night's sleep. You know how when you get the fever and you have the chills and yeah. then you're burning up and you're like yep. all that kind of stuff. Uh, thanks, kids, by the way. Um, but it was one of those ones where I watched it Sunday morning and I just was kind of like just kind of zoned out. But yeah, like that's yeah, a movie a you got Sunday morning kind of film. Yeah, but that's a movie yeah. you got to be present for. I yeah. Mean, so yeah, I mean, really I think I might be. not have done it justice. So. Yeah. Maybe I'll give it you can't a especially, drop lid. Especially the gay sex, right, John? And that was awesome. And you can't you can't watch it on a phone. You gotta be focused. <laughs> no, no, I want to see there wasn't there wasn't any gay sex because he no. was already dead. Yeah, that's it wasn't it was real. necrophilia yeah. gay. It was well, gay I mean, necrophilia. I, weird that's missionary sex. I still I'm still pondering how they pull that one off. Oh my <laughs> god. In American gods, they really show it. Not that hard to figure out. Okay. I know. Spin Diana, the wheel you, already around. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so there's three of us. Oh, I hope it comes on me, John. I hope this spin. I hope it on comes me. on you. All right, I knew you were gonna. I knew you were gonna. <laughs> all of us strangers. jump on that this, one. This uh, show oh, has taken. Come on, come Our on, show come has on. Take oh, <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> Under the skin, baby. Oh, revenge is a dish served cold and in the black <laughs> void. I can't wait. So I think that's where we're gonna oh, go. Oh, that way, I don't have to I watch it to... too. I've just watched it, so that's oh good. yeah, no so good. Yeah, right oh, neither do I. So let's oh, do uh, when, I, when we come watch. back in two weeks. We're gonna we're gonna do a little uh, under the skin. 
All right. Um, Cause I really, I really want to get your takes on it. Cause it's, it's a fascinating no, you film. Don't. You don't want to get my take. No, on I it. know what your take is. Yeah, you're okay. just, so, you're going to be gone. So you know what? Put up just my picture and you guys say what I'll probably say. So I don't have to watch it. I think you should give it a shot. The, the no, movie itself and the, like the, the way film. that he it's made really the movie kind of, is fascinating. And fascinating. Scarlett Johansson's amazing. I think you should check it out. What? You don't like to see Scarlett Johansson naked. What's the problem? Yeah. There's a lot of that too. There's a lot of that. Yeah. A lot of Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. Down, well, Sean. there's got to be something else in it that Ralph is smirking like a Cheshire cat over there. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, as soon as there's one scene specifically that happens, that I go, I turn to Maria, I go, no way. He could watch that. It's not going to happen. But now you have to. So I sat through well, the general. I sat I through the hope, general. I just hope I, <laughs> I hope I feel okay. You got two I'm, weeks. You'll be fine. You'll, you'll be I fine. definitely feel like yeah. something. Actually, on. you'll. I think. I think you'll end up enjoying the film. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's got a lot I, to I say. Found it fascinating. I, I'm looking forward to seeing it again, I will admit. And I got to, yeah. you know, I got to say, watching it, it, he did the same thing in Zone of Interest. I mean, he, the way he layered the sound in this one is quite impressive. Um, so, yeah. OK, so Under the Skin in two weeks. What's the movie we're doing next week? Kahani. Kahani. How, how long is that? Oh, yeah. One? I don't know. Does it matter? Is it available? You're not going to watch it. Can You're going to watch I, a no, recap. Gonna, of it. I'm going to watch it. Can I stream it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's been made available to us. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Can't Be wait. Streaming. I'll squeeze it in. I'm on an airplane for seven hours. I could watch it on that. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Seven hours. I'm sorry, you're not in the yeah, cockpit. So what are you taking? What are you taking? A helicopter? Because it's fourteen hours. It said it's it's the time thing. It's that whole maybe it's oh, what yeah, five it's not hours. Seven hours. I think. It's, All right. It's I think I can squeeze in a three-hour movie. Is my point. Seven hours to. What do you? <laughs> I think it's I can a solid four and a half to Arizona, though. Yeah. Okay. But it's not seven. It's 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 six and a half to He's California. He's got to come back too, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think we're going the, the long, that long. We're going the long way. We're flying. Why are you yeah. going to Arizona? They're coming very close to the. Oh, edge you're going to see. Uh, do I have to tell you everything? Yeah. You're going to see. I'm uh, seeing my they... son, Dylan. I'm hanging out with Dylan and his uh, in-laws, his future in-laws or his whatever they call them. Oh, now. oh, that's where her family lives? Oh, is this no. where we're going to meet the parents? They're renting a house in Scottsdale. Oh, very nice. And we're going to golf. That we're going to golf. Love that part days. of the world. So cool. I'm running a house in Scotts Guard. You know, you never yeah. have to worry about rain damage. I'm very putting nice. we'll Scotts right. Yeah. All right. So you guys have a good week. And then right. next week we'll do uh, the Indian film. And then the week after that, a little under the skin with Scarlett Johansson. I think you're directed by Michael skin. Glazer. So. Have you guys, Chris, have Glazer. you seen it? I keep calling him like, you know, it's been a while. It's, I think I saw it. So I'll have to rewatch it. So I wrote down, old. just so you know, uh, I wrote down Jonathan, but I said, Michael, who's Michael Glazer. That's an actor, right? Who's Michael Keith? I don't know. Sounds familiar. Hey. All right. Anyway, guys, have a good week. We'll see you next week. Sounds see good. You guys. Have a good one.